For uh, the center region and center county, lost John I got in 2020. Uh, when you get elected to local government, you instantly learn that you have a lot to learn. You come to rely upon people who have knowledge of your local governments, their policies, and their histories. The best of these folks are like walking libraries, and John Ike was definitely one of them for me. Few people I know were as well informed about the functioning of local government. His four years as county commissioner and as county administrator were very productive. He, the statecollege.com noted he worked to increase public housing, protect watersheds, implement paper verified voting systems, and improve infrastructure and emergency communication. He served the borough of State College and on our planning commission and was our representative on the Center Region Planning Commission. John was one of the most dedicated public servants I have had the privilege of knowing. The borough, the Center Region, and Center County have benefited from his presence. Our sincere condolences to his wife, Kathleen, and to his loved ones. Uh, thank you for the chance to speak, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Marlowe, and, and uh, our thoughts to the family and appreciation for the lifelong service. Uh, moving on, introductions. Uh, Jim Saylor has someone to introduce us to. Hi, good evening. I just want to take a very quick moment to introduce our new senior transportation planner, Ms. Ann Mesner. She comes to us from Center County, and I would like to just give her a moment or two to tell us a little bit about herself. All right. Thank you. Um, I have lived in Center County for 20 years. I work for the Borough State College for 12, and for Center County for three. Uh, previous to that, I worked for another NPO in Pennsylvania, a TMA in New Jersey, and the Northern Virginia Construction District. Uh, so I have a little bit of experience in transportation, Thank you, Ann. Welcome. Uh, moving on, recognitions. Lisa Collins, I believe, has something to share. Yeah, I'm lucky enough to have a couple of things to share tonight. Uh, the first of which is that uh, Josh Cole, who is a school library staff member, um, who I believe is here. There's Josh uh, poking up, waving at everyone. So Josh is a full-time IT technician here at SCLO, and he recently received an achievement award for his work on the SCLO Library website redesign project. Uh, Josh's direct supervisor couldn't be with us tonight, but I wanted to read what he wrote about Josh and his work on this particular project. His persistent effort, keen insight, and sustained, thorough, but clear communication efforts are the single reason why our critical behind the scenes, easy proxy integration efforts were a success. This work in particular was perhaps the most intricate and nuanced of the entire project. And we hope that for the patrons, it will be completely invisible and seamless. And it absolutely is. It just works. It looks easy. It's not. And we are so lucky to have Josh um, on our team um, helping us achieve the website that we have for our entire community. And this really is just one example. Thank Josh um, in front of the general forum and um, uh, just uh, encourage you, if you're ever at school library and you have a moment, stop in to see Josh. He's got lots and lots of really amazing knowledge to share. So thank you, Josh, so much. Thanks for the kind words, Lisa. And then I have um, another amazing uh, couple of things to share, and this time it is uh, for Maria Birchall, who should be here with us tonight. Let me just find her up on my screen here. There's Maria, waving at everybody. <laughs> Um, so Maria is our head of adult and teen services, um, and it's a really good night because the wonderful news is that SCLO's adult and teen services department, uh, in partnership with art teachers from the State College Area School District, is receiving a Pennsylvania Library Association Best Practices Award uh, for creating and developing an innovative services program. Now, the Reduce, Reuse, Remake, a re student recycled art exhibition and creating opportunities for them to express themselves. So that's one 
Pennsylvania Library Association Best Practices Award that I'm telling you about. But I also get to tell you that her team got a second Pennsylvania PA Forward Adult Programming Award as well for their innovative English as a Second Language or ESL Book Club. Uh, this online program helps individuals that want to improve their English skills um, and meets on Wednesday mornings uh, virtually. Uh, it gives individuals time to read out loud in a very supportive environment, and we know it's really helped an enormous number of people. Both programs are going to be shared statewide and offer other libraries some examples of things that they can do uh, to work and partner and really develop innovative programs for their communities. So what we do here in the center region then expands to the state and hopefully beyond that. Um, so I wanted all of us to uh, join in congratulating Maria, the head of adult and team services and the entire adult and team services department on two PALA Best Practices Awards for 2022. This is not an easy thing to do, a uh, great achievement and uh, very prestigious. Uh, so congratulations, Maria. That this is a group that is useful and helpful to you and that we can reconvene periodically to check in on those actions um, that you wanna take and to continue providing support as you work to institutionalize DEI practices in your municipalities um, and face the additional challenges and opportunities that you have. Um, so that's all we really wanna share with you tonight. Please look for more information and we're happy to take any questions that you might have at this time. Questions for Sharima or Lori? Thank you both for joining us this evening and we look forward to getting the invite. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Continuing on, solar per power purchase agreement update. Ms. Donnell Del Corso. We did that just for the <laughs> Lovely, okay. Hi everyone, my name is Danelle Del Corso. I'm a former township supervisor and this January I was appointed by the COG Executive Committee to represent you all on the Solar Power Purchase Agreement Working Group. It's been a few months since we provided an update to this body, so uh, we have an update for you on where we are. I'll ask the angel away, it's lovely. So the agenda for this evening, hopefully relatively quick for you, it is to go over the current status of where we are in the process, to provide an overview of what this project is all about, and that is to provide some repetitive information for you. It may be repetitive for you, it may be new to you, but I know Peter Buck has said in the past that in order to help absorb some of this and retain this information, hearing it multiple times is a good thing. Then we'll go over the timeline of uh, the effort between now and January, and then talk about some specific next steps. So this graphic shows you the major steps in the purchase process, and if you look, obviously, the check marks mean that those items are done. So a milestone occurred this month, which is to release the RFP. So the effort to date has been to come up with a draft and distribute one single RFP, a joint effort between all 15 entities that are involved in this process. So there's a little um, image up there that says where we are. The next step in this process, and which we'll talk about in the timeline when I get to it, is aligning everyone to a particular developer to sign a contract. So the effort between now and then is really all about accepting these RFPs and evaluating. So that's where we are. The overview I'm going to provide to you now is really just to review the why, the who, the what, and the how. So we'll probably hopefully go through these relatively quickly for you. Starting with the why. These are the guiding principles that the working group used in order to develop the RFP. So these are some of the statements and guiding principles that were involved in that RFP process. Uh, I don't need to read you. This project involved in this, these are some of the key points. Uh, providing one proposal that represented all. And regarding that, the goal is to have a template agreement. 
We are expecting solar price to be lower than the current market. In the working group meeting yesterday morning, um, the developer, solar developers are seeing about five cents per kilowatt hour. And a few of the municipalities here uh, are seeing 10 to 11 cents per kilowatt hour. The term options, uh, we're looking at 5, 15, and 25 years. Those are options. We've mentioned a few times uh, that renewable energy credits is a consideration in this RFP. And we also mentioned that you don't have to think about it now, wait until a little bit later when we get a little bit closer and start receiving back some RFPs. The goal is also to align with current electricity agreement terms. So, for instance, if we decide to sign a contract, all 15 entities will not be signing on the same day. We will align with your existing electricity agreement terms. Go ahead and change. Oh, and this is the how. So, the how is these RFPs are going to be coming back, and we have to try and choose top providers. So, I believe this might have been presented the last time we talked or we talked about it. The first pass through the RFPs, if you look at where it says first round, um, the solar developer and retail services will be evaluated differently, but that first round, the same criteria will be evaluated for all. Pricing and term, experience and qualifications. After that first round, some may get knocked out of the running, and then in that second round, there will be different criteria for solar developers than the retail services, and you can see the percentages of weight of those criteria. So that's the how. So before I go too far here, I just want to pause one second. Are there any clarifications needed at this point before I go on? All right, sweet. So the timeline. The RFP was released September, I can't see from here, is that 13? 13. Open proposals, October 19th. The goal is to have, by November 9th, the top three proposals chosen. By the end of November, the goal is to have completed three interviews with those top three proposals, or top three providers, and send a recommendation to the boards. The boards then, you know, December to January 18, uh, will be asked to evaluate and provide a uh, recommendation with a goal of awarding the contract by the end of January. Any clarifications, questions about that? Okay, it's a lot to absorb. Um, so the next steps are these. The PMT is the project management team. They are in the process of studying energy markets to understand what the long-term commitment is. Uh, they are working with our um, energy consultant, uh, Green Sky, also working with Penn State Facilities Engineering Institute and another energy consultant. So they're doing a lot of research to try and gain as much information as possible to be able to help everyone make the most informed decision. The Renewable Energy Credits, or RECs, October expect to get some information, some education around options, uh, and then will help in your discussion for your own boards and entities. Just as a feeder to that, there's a couple scenarios. If your organization is looking for the lowest cost, you will likely want to sell your RECs, Renewable Energy Credits. If your organization has climate policy or sustainability goals established, you will likely consider keeping your renewable energy credits. So with those two kind of pathways in mind, that's what we're going to be, uh, the working group and project management team are going to be gathering information to provide to you to help make those choices for you, to help you make those choices. So look for that in October. And with all of that, we're here to ask what additional information might you need in order to proceed with a contract and signing a con feeling confident signing a contract for solar power purchase agreement. And I know that's a loaded question and you have a lot to absorb. So what we want to know is if there's anything now you want to share, absolutely 
Joe Vigilone and Pam um, is on, Pam Adams is online as well. We will accept any questions, concerns, clarifications that you need. So if you have any now, we'd be happy to entertain them. Any questions or clarifications needed for Pam or our various representatives? All right, well, that was easy. Thank you all very much. Thank you, Danelle. Appreciate your representation. Continuing on, Pennsylvania redistricting, redistricting a presentation by Ms. Tiffany Baker of our Center Region Code Administration Office. Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm only going to take up a few minutes of your time. Um, we're going to talk about the Center County Legislative District changes. Eric and I have had this on our radar for a few months and have been meeting occasionally. So I threw together um, just a handful of slides. I'm going to share my screen. Maybe, there we go. Okay, so just a brief overview of what we all know currently. So the current state representative districts, um, Rich Irvin, Scott Conklin, Carrie Benninghoff, and this is how the center county is split up, all our municipalities here. And we have one Senator, Senator Jay Corman. So as of December 1st, we're gonna have two senators and new re um, representative district, Belfont Borough only. So the other uh, municipalities are gonna be shifted around a little bit. Uh, State College Borough is split between two districts. The Senate will be split up with Senator Wayne Langerholt. He is out of Johnstown and Senator Chris Dush out of Brookville. Um, Ferguson, Half Moon and Patton will be with Senator Langerholt, College Township, Harris Township, Belfont Borough, and State College Borough will have Senator Chris Dush. Little bit of information about each senator, um, a and also a reminder of the municipalities that they are going to be representing. Um, Senator Langerholt was elected in 2016. His term expires in 2024, the same with um, Senator Dush. That's when they will be up for reelection again. Um, a little bit of information about the committees. He's chair of the Transfer, uh, Transportation Committee and um, has a member of the um, list of following committees right there and the counties and areas that he currently represents. Senator Chris Dush um, will have College Harris State College and Belfont again. He was elected in 2020. He also is up in 2024. He is the chair of the Intergovernmental Operations Committee and Local Government Committees, vice chair of the State Government Committee. Some of his district will be changing as well when he takes on part of Center County. So one of the things that Eric and I have been working on is we are planning a, to schedule meet and greets with each of these senators in the general forum room um, at the COG building. We have Senator Chris Dush on Tuesday, December 6th, and Senator Langerholt on uh, Wednesday, December 7th. So what we are thinking is each municipality will be invited to come the evening that their senator is here. I have been communicating with staff from both the senator's office. They are um, very excited about this. They are very appreciative for this opportunity. They are looking forward to meeting with everyone and learning a little more about each municipality and the COG in general. So we are thinking of having the elected officials, the municipality managers, the agency directors, and um, some administrative staff there. Um, I have been in communications with the agency directors. I've asked them to think of some of their current projects, future projects, wish lists, things like that. Each senator has asked me to send that to them ahead of time so they can um, become a little more familiar before arriving in December. And then we are thinking of having each municipality have a maybe have the chair speak or representative speak for a few minutes about your municipality and what your 
priorities are and what you feel is important for the senators to know. So Center County will be new to them and speaking to the staff. Um, I know some of their staff are not familiar with what a COG is. So um, we're gonna have some, some education opportunities here. Um, since I've presented this to the executive committee, I have received some good news that both senators are planning on having offices in Center County. I do not know where yet, but the last time I presented this, we didn't know if anybody would, but they both have hired a staff member that will be located in Center County, um, which will be nice for all of us. So I'm hoping they will attend these meetings as well. So the plan is to have a, about an hour, just a nice casual meet and greet, light refreshments, things like that, allow the senators to introduce themselves and allow each of us to, to put our priorities on their radar. Um, I have already been told that they, they are excited and anxious to get involved. So they wanna know however they can help, they wanna know. So I think this is a great opportunity for us to, um, really introduce the the center county to them um, since this will be new for us and for them so um, with that i will open it up for any questions that you may have the evening plans for the events are are a work in progress so i don't have too much concrete information for that evening so i welcome any feedback questions or comments to share with Tiffany? <clears throat> Yes, please. Uh, I'm, I'm delighted to hear that uh, they plan on having offices in Center County. Mm -hmm. And I hope strongly that we can have the staff members to be responsible for that here. Because our important liaison is between our managers and their staff. So making that connection soon and strong is important. Excellent point. Excellent point. Absolutely. Any other comments uh, to share with Tiffany. One. And for, from what I've heard, excuse me, for what I've heard, um, the staff that they are that they are bringing in are current staff members of Senator Corman's office. So they are going to be very familiar with the COG, the municipalities and everything that they've already done in the past. So I think that's going to be a great addition and um, a great opportunity to um, communicate with the senators and, and they should really help update them on, on our priorities, so. Excellent, thank you. Uh, one other general note, uh, the executive committee also discussed once the election dust has settled the, for the House of Representatives, having a similar uh, meet and greet in probably February. So anticipate, yes. anticipate seeing that mm -hmm. uh, once we get a little further. Uh, if nothing else, Tiffany, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Thank you. Next item, COG Building Intermunicipal Agreement Modification. Eric Thornburg. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is a follow-up conversation and presentation and potential vote uh, following up uh, to a presentation that was made to the general forum in July. At that point, we reviewed the history of the COG building intermunicipal agreement and the lease and the research that had begun several years ago by the fine, excuse me, by the facilities committee and staff into the uh, nature of the intermunicipal agreement and the lease uh, and the fact that the lease terminates in, uh, in uh, discussed uh, almost exactly a year ago. Unfortunately, that is not the case with this therefore that's why the questions came forward and the, the, the big thing that drove this just for information was in the facilities commission committee there was discussions about long-term improvements uh, to this facility and there was a question who's whose is it do we want to put money into somebody else's uh, asset and that's when the question became the research was done uh, Again, this process started in 2018, uh, so it, it, it's on a, a rocket pace at this point. But, um, but yes, it, we're making a decision now that it is going to be reflected in 2028. So, a, a follow-up question then, if this were approved tonight, 
where does it go from here? Does it have to go to each of the municipalities? Uh, in Eric, uh, I, so the way that the solicitor has drafted this, uh, the chairs of each municipality would would sign, would execute it, and then it would become binding. So the vote tonight is the vote to approve this. Right. If you if you read the the proposed motion, it indicates that 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 they would be forwarded to uh, refer to the center region municipalities for action to approve the document. I wasn't sure if that was happening here. No. Other questions? Can you clarify that? Uh, this only means we're referring to Ms. Powers for approval. It's, yeah. Yes. It, you, you, the general forum, by its unit vote, is indicating to it and asking the chairs to sign in respect of the motion that is but being made. Ms. Powers for approval. The, yes, we can't sign. Nobody, the COD can't sign on behalf of the municipality. But there's no signature required tonight to prove to you. I, as I read this very last part, it says, refer to Senator Region Municipalities for action to approve the document. So this is we are for this municipalities to approve the document. So each municipality can vote yes or no at, at, at their meeting. Is that what you're saying? I don't believe that was the intent, uh, but certainly. I mean, it, well, it, it could be important. No, I, I absolutely agree. And, um, that needs clarified. Right. And and there may be a correction needed to the draft uh, motion, potentially. Eric, go ahead. When the Cox solicitor reviewed this, it, it was his opinion that uh, the, this by, by adopting the intermunicipal agreement amendment tonight, it would empower each of the municipalities to proceed with with signing the agreement. However, he cannot provide legal advice for each uh, board or council. And if any of the municipalities uh, solicitor uh, provides advice that says a separate resolution needs to be uh, approved locally uh, to authorize that signature by the, the chair or uh, president of council or, or whomever the presiding officer that would sign that, that's why that was uh, left a little vague there, but uh, you know th this was not considered something that re required an ordinance on behalf of each municipality. So uh, it's possible, according to our solicitor, that this could uh, be the final vote tonight as each municipality casts its vote. Great, Eric. Thank you. Yes, sir. Chair. Um, so the signature by each of the chairs of each of the townships is a formality. That's, that's that happens after the general form here approves the agreement. And I had a question about unit uh, unanimous unit vote. I take that to mean that each of the board's majority would be considered a unit vote, not a un, unit unanimous vote of each of the boards. That is correct. Yes. In other words, every member of every board. Correct. No. No, you, each each uh, member municipality votes as a unit, and then you need a majority of your members in attendance to, to vote in favor of that, for it to be a favorable vote. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Evans. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, so COG, is essentially a committee jointly among the municipalities. And if you give COG ownership of a building, how does that work? COG has no way of raising money to maintain that building except coming to the municipalities and no other permanent, you know, so essentially you lose control of the building, but you still have to pay for the building. It just seems odd to me. Ms. Evans, are you aware that the COG currently owns the land that the building is sitting on? Yes. Okay. So owning the building is in similar fashion to the to the land. 
Well, the land doesn't require maintenance in the same way as a building that's however old. Depends on the land, yes. Uh, the, there's there's uh, land improvements that, that are generally part of most structures, but yes. And that's actually, again, going back to the origination of this, the, the, the thing that started this whole conversation was sidewalks and parking lots, and the parking lot, and, and the repair thereof, which are improvements to the land. Okay, I just find funny that ownership is going to a committee of the uh, municipalities. Well, the COG is, is a legal entity, uh, thus it can own land, so that, that, that's a distinction. I, I think we would refer to ourselves as more than a committee uh, and everything, but other questions, comments? Yes. I, I need one more clarification. Yes, sir. Uh, does this, this document we're going to tonight, does that declare where the rent money is going to go? Only because it says that nothing changes until all of the rent payments are made. The original agreement. What that means. The original agreement specifies where rent payments are to go through 2028. Yes, to two municipalities. Correct. Yes. Well, that does this document change that? Not the least. Okay, so it's it's specifically distinctive that none of this happens until after those final payments are made. Okay. Well, here here's a, a, a little mixed about this because. Sure. In 2028 is a different board, and they may think differently. We're sort of acting, we're acting for them, and that's a little bit concerned. It, I don't know what there's a timeline on that. The other thing is uh, the, the, the deed states uh, that the Senator Regent Council owns the land, and I, I've had two different attorneys tell me they own the building also. So what the call already owns the building, unless it has wheels or unless it's a boat. If they call the, the, the deed is, is still there. Now, this may clarify that. Correct. I think that's what you're trying to do is clarify that. The call does. And I think in after 80 something, the cog is now, the legislature says cog is allowed to own property. They own this property. The building is part of the property. So this is simply clearing up the fact that the cog does own the building and the property. That's absolutely now, correct. The other, the other, there was three documents on this. One other document was how the building was purchased. That was simply who who bought it, what shares we paid, and if somebody wants out, if somebody wants in. Right first, right refusal of municipality, second right refusal of government, third right refusal of the armies. So, the, now that is a third, a second document. The third document is where rent money is distributed. So my concern is, how is that affect third document where money is distributed? How does that affect? Eric, you can confirm this, but it, it was very distinct on the solicitor's part. Correct. The, uh, the original intermunicipal agreement from uh, 2001 uh, has an amendment clause, and the only part that is being exercised related to that is related to the section on the, uh, the uh, amendment to the lease. And so that's that's what this is about. You know, we're we're not talking anything about the uh, financial uh, payments regarding the rent and any decisions that would come in 2028 once all of the rent payments have been completed. Uh, at that point, uh, the uh, COD committees and municipalities uh, would come to an agreement as to what happens uh, in terms of how the bills would be paid for operation of a building once the lease payments have been concluded. Uh, but that's, you know, the, once again, the, the agreement is silent on what happens after the end of the lease on several things, including that. So, and the other, so the third document that you're speaking of is the lease. And the lease specifies the payment terms. And the lease is not being modified by any action that we're taking. So in 2028, the decision will be how much a rent is going to be, and who it goes to. There won't be any more rent. There won't be any more rent. It will be, instead of getting the rent credit, and, and that's what uh, we may need to uh, back up, uh, the rent 
credit against our municipal contribution. Okay. I think you make my decision. Bye. Okay. Uh, other questions? Clarification? Yes, please. We're saying that, but basically, the mortgage and the dog is paying back the level of money that was put in plus interest, and that those payments are all complete in 2028. Right. And if you look at the audit statement, and it's been there since. I, I it's 2003. What, what was the comment there? What? I missed it. We're calling it rent, but it, it's a de facto mortgage. And, and it happened because at that time, hogs could not borrow money. money. At this point, they're being reimbursed for the money they paid for this. Okay. Once, once that. it's been paid, then, then we rent income from rent. No? no. Well, but, okay. Kind of, yeah, kind of <laughs> You're welcome to interpret it as you see fit. Mr. Chair, I have another question. Yes, sir. Let's let's say this all happens in 2028. The building gets turned over to COG. What are COG's options in terms of what they can do with the building and lands? And you know, what potential are, is there in the future of selling it larger? Larger properties, larger buildings, expanding the size. What that, that's all up to COG at that point, right? Correct. That's all up to them as an organization, not up to the individual municipalities. As the right. So, example: College Township couldn't say, "I want to expand the COG building today." We would need unanimous unanimous with our municipal partners the same is true if we if, Co if college township wants to expand the building in 2029 we would need the unanimous of the right. of our partners so the, the, the purpose for asking that question is this what then is the urgency in making this decision six years before the end of the lease what benefit does it have to change the current arrangement, I, that's the part that I do not understand. We, you know, COG is us, we are COG. <laughs> you know, and we're, we're operating in a building and we have the facilities that we currently need. In, in 2028 20, or 2029 or 2030, you know, what changes, what, what is the main driver behind doing I guess what I'm asking. And I'll reference again my reference to the beginning of this discussion in 2018 with regard to long range facility planning and the gray area of what does happen. The reason that has been brought forward is so that we can do our long range facility planning, knowing who, who has what. A very similar discussion would be Millbrook Marsh. Uh, there was a lot of discussion on that that we did not want to move forward on that until we had the lease understanding. We didn't want to invest in Penn State's property on, without knowing what the long-term uh, relationship was. And so this is in a similar vein to that. Uh, and so the COG is us, we are COG argument can go both ways on that. Uh, very point, uh, but that was how we got here. And and with why are we trying to do it now? Uh, again, because we've we've been pursuing this for three years. We're going to have new members. We're going to have more new members. Each new member uh, becomes a new education process. It's been the experience of of Cog is when you've got it to a point, get it done. But do you expect? obsolescence and size of the facilities are, 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 are members of this organization um, expecting to expand the size of the, the operation and increase the facility sizes I mean there's a there's a long-range facilities plan you know what does that mean does that mean a larger building larger properties more people more you know operations I would only offer we can't decide who's supposed to fix the parking lot at this point. So I don't think we've gotten to whether we want to make the building bigger. Um, uh, Patty, I got you. I'm going to go to Elliot okay. and then come to you and then Laura. 
Go ahead, Elliot. Okay. Um, to me, I mean, it seems like there are many different possibilities that could come out of this, but is there some overriding reason why we should do this tonight rather than say, wait till next year? The, the, the idea that there are gonna be new people doesn't frighten me. I think that uh, we should assume or hope that whatever new people are on boards are at least as smart as we are and hopefully smarter. And uh, unless we're pessimists, that uh, then, then we would have to worry and, oh, let's get this done now because things are going to be bad in the future. I, I don't buy that. that. That's a fair, very fair argument. But when the conclusion seems evident, as Mr. Graham said, he's talked to a couple of attorneys. And uh, if you own the land and there's nothing that says you don't own the building that's on that land, generally you own that building. Uh, that's my familiarity with it as well, but uh, Patty, I please. Two points to, to Elliot. I think the idea is we put all this effort and have all this knowledge now, so we want to get it made so we don't keep repeating this and using people's time and, and going over and over to make a decision. And Ron said, why are we doing this six years out? Well, really, we're doing it 12 years late. You know, like you said, it should have been in the original lease, and most leases say what happens to an entity that you're leasing when it's over. Really should have been in at the beginning, and that's what we're trying to correct. So that when it comes to the end, we know exactly what should have been in there. And, and I think actually, Mr. Graham in a previous meeting said we had a hard enough time getting to this point. It, it was that can was kicked down the road, right. and, and so now we're just trying to, to clean that up. Laura. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you all for this uh, good discussion. Um, my, I guess my question is a little off topic, so I'm going to just put it on the table and I don't expect an answer and I appreciate the ability to voice it. Um, my question relates to something I believe Chair said about um, uh, like ownership and expansion. I believe he said like, for example, one municipality couldn't expand the building on their own, right? We'd have to do that together. It just got me to thinking about the fire stations, and perhaps this is our next uh, group effort to understand what to do in terms of the fire station, because the question that popped to my mind was, well, I'm pretty sure that all of our fire stations are owned by individual municipalities. So if one of the fire stations needed to expand, would the individual municipality make that decision or the cost? Laura, that's a great point because- Really don't even expect any dialogue on this question. Um, it just really popped to my mind. And I think Mr. I think it was Mr. Cervillo that asked the question, not sure, but I envision that long-term facility plan as um, like working out some of those things and then planning for what we need and, and it not being at all about expansion other than what's absolutely necessary. But then that's my, that's just my thought. So thank you for the time and that's it. Thank you. No, Laura, that's a great point because, and we can reference if any of the facility members, the next topic after the COG building uh, was the fire stations because they are also subject to uh, agreements that are not clear on who does what, when, and everything like that. Um, with the challenges that we've had making the case for the COG building, we haven't even taken up the fire stations yet. I know that was on Lou's uh, radar before he left, uh, but yeah, it's a it's a very that's part of it. You know, the agreements establish who does what and and everything like that, and we we've got some gray, and that's what was the facilities committee was trying to clean up. Mr. Chair, I have one more. Yes, comment. sir. At least between two independent parties is one thing. At least of this nature between municipalities that make up an organization and that organization is a completely different animal. Now, I'm sure the people that wrote this lease back in the day when they wrote it had their reasons for writing it the way they did. So I would not want to discount what those people wrote at that time. And there was a reason why they did it. And they had a reason why they did it. What they did. So this is a unique type of lease. I just want to stress that point. It's not the lease between two independent parties where when your lease is up, you've made your payment, you now own the building. That's a whole different thing. And to, for an attorney to say that, you know, 
you own the land, the building's on your land, therefore you own the building. That, I think, is a faulty deduction. So I don't see things that way. I, you know, we, we created, the municipalities created God, and as an as a entity in order to serve certain purposes, make, gain certain efficiencies in operation, I get all that. But it's not as simple, it's not as cut and dry as two separate entities entering into an agreement. So I just wanted to point that out. The only thing I would have to, uh, offer in contract law, they are separate entities. Uh, there's a reason. You can have an LLC that has all the same part, parties as another LLC. It's still a legal document between the two entities. The other thing, Eric, would you happen, I believe we got a, one of uh, the solicitor's opinion letters. He offered his thoughts on how we may have got here. Uh, and I, I alluded to it in that there was such a challenge in getting the building over the threshold that it was left silent uh, for future general forums to, to resolve. Um, and so we're a future general forum. You can have the discussion that, well, let's just wait for six years. I, I would only offer, it's been three years now. So the thing we, we were trying to do is be uh, effective to make these long-term facility decision points and everything. And that's why we've pursued it to, to this point. Any other questions or clarifications? Um, yes, Carl, oh, please. So, first of all, let me state that I am absolutely in favor of taking care of this issue tonight, and I intend to vote forward for this. Um, but I just have a question for clarification, perhaps. So, because I've because I've seen us try to expand parking, and I've seen us try to make some of these improvements on this building. Um, so, without doing this, how how do we take care of this space? How how are those decisions made if we don't clarify this document? That's a great question, and I would refer to the agenda, uh, page six. Should the general forum not pass the recommended motion, it is requested that members continue discussion on this topic as staff requires direction on how to plan for and reach decisions regarding capital investment replacement during the remainder of the lease and what happens at the end of the lease. Right. So kicking the can down the road, at some point the can's got to be picked up. And I just think it's it's time to do this. We we have we have decisions we need to make about the building all together. Nobody's making this decision for us. We we do everything you know as a group here. Um, it's just easier to do if we know if we know what the rules of the game are and we're not stuck in the muddy quagmire of an unfinished document. So that's it. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Carl. Any other? comments or questions? At this point, uh, we can do nothing, or staff has provided a motion to be considered. And at that point, I turn it over to Bobby, uh, if someone's prepared to make it. I will make the motion. We have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. Second. We have a couple seconds. Thank you. Chair? Yes, sir. Request to unit vote. Thank you, sir. At this point, we will recess it recess, is that the correct phrasing? Into our our municipal bodies such that we can take a unit vote. I'll turn it over to Scott on how we're gonna accomplish this. Uh, just I would Seeing or hearing none. Okay. Um, we did this exercise last month, so it should be pretty fresh and familiar. Um, I will share uh, in a couple moments a list of phone numbers uh, so that the uh, municipalities can gather with uh, your remote partners there 
Um, I will say we have at least half moon has uh, a quorum, nobody remote. So I would ask uh, one of you to call into the number anyway in case there's any members of the public on that would like to hear your discussion. And theme with College Township, uh, so all numbers will be open regardless <coughs> of the quorums that we have in the room. Every municipality does have a quorum. Um, again, just remember to scan stopped. phone.
bring up my screen for everybody else. Harris, if we could bring the meeting back to order, please. Thank you. Okay, very good. Uh, all municipalities have reported in uh, that they have come to a consensus vote. At this point, Scott will roll call the municipalities. Right. On the uh, motion to approve the amendment uh, as listed in the agenda, State College of Borough? Uh, yes. College Township? Yes. Ferguson Township? Yes. Half Moon Township? Yes. Harris Township? No. Patton Township? Yes. Uh, be unanimous in it. That's correct. Uh, requiring a unanimous vote, the one dissenting vote, we have the motion fails. Uh, again, as staff has requested, with that vote, uh, we need to provide direction on how to plan and reach decisions regarding capital investment replacement during the remainder of the lease and what happens at the end of the lease. Continuing on, university report, Ms. Young. Yes, good evening. I just have one brief thing just to note. The BOT last week approved our state funding request, which is a tremendous increase of over 47% that we will be asking the state for state appropriations. Uh, you may not know, but we are the lowest funded per student compared to Pitt and Temple. So um, we will be moving forward with that. So wish us luck and give us support. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Young. Uh, do we have any representatives from the State College Area School District? Not seeing or hearing any. Executive Director Report, Mr. Norenberg. Uh, thank you, good evening. Uh, in your packet is the September activity report and uh, myself or agency directors would be happy to respond to any questions that anyone has about the highlights uh, featured in this month's report. And I would also like to draw your attention to item 17E in the matters of record. Uh, that particular item indicates uh, and provides a link for a survey. Uh, we are hoping to get feedback as those of you who are in the room tonight uh, probably have noticed and those watching uh, remotely, uh, we have completed installation of some acoustic panels that hopefully is making it easier to hear uh, the conversation in the room. So uh, whether you're uh, normally participating remotely or you know, typically, you know, you know, sometimes uh, in the room, sometimes remotely, we'd like your feedback. Uh, based on the, the recently installed panels and uh, if you've been in the meeting uh, tonight or in the next week or so, please click that link and fill that out. Uh, let us know how uh, it is improved and if you have any suggestions for continued improvement on that. Thank you. Questions for the director or any agency directors? Seeing or hearing none, we'll go to our Authority Board and Committee Reports, Executive Committee, Mr. Barlow. Well, um, there's really nothing, um, uh, there's really nothing we discussed at Executive Committee that isn't kind of reflected in our agenda here. Um, so uh, I can simply say that what's there is accurate. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Barlow. For the Finance Committee, Mr. Gervino is not with us. Uh, the notes in the agenda do cover the September 8th. Uh, meeting. However, I will advise that the the finance committee met this morning for what was to be the first of their uh, 2023 detailed budget report uh, reviews. Prior to that meeting, uh, a letter or memorandum from the all of the center region managers was forwarded to Cox staff and all the finance committee representatives in that asking for a pause uh, on the, the budget. Uh, that resulted from the, for those that aren't aware, the draft detailed budget that was released contained a 16 plus percent increase uh, to the tune of about $1.3 million uh, in municipal contributions. After hearing 
from the managers at this morning's meeting and then having opening statements from all of the members of the Finance Committee. A motion was made uh, by Mr. Trevino and seconded to remand the budget back to COG staff with a guideline of an 8% increase and that we would uh, shuffle meetings accordingly back to allow the, the staff to to have enough time to review what would be required to achieve that. The motion passed uh, and as such staff has already begun working, uh, having discussions on how that might uh, be accomplished, uh, what that would look like. Um, Again, we'll what was asked of that is there needs to be flexibility from the finance committee members uh, to adjusted schedules, as and also since the COG budget is such a portion of municipal budgets, the the resulting potential delays in that element of it. So uh, I guess I would put stay tuned. Uh, be interesting to see where that where that comes and uh, it is kind of unprecedented and in, in whatnot but 16% was kind of unprecedented as well so uh, the committee felt that it, it wanted to give staff uh, the opportunity to prioritize and place before the finance committee came in as judge and jury uh, and, and indicated how we might be adjusting. That's a big item. I'm going to open it up. Any questions to the general forum uh, on that discussion? Okay, very good. Stay tuned uh, on that. Uh, Human Resources Committee did not meet. They meet next uh, Wednesday, October 12th. Parks Capital did not meet. They meet in November, November 10th. Public Safety Committee, Mr. Takak. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, think the summary provided in the agenda does a fine job of uh, summarizing our meeting, but I'd be happy to answer any questions. Seeing or hearing none, Facilities Committee did not meet. They're scheduled for October 4th. Land Use and Community Infrastructure Committee, Mr. Harry Meister. It's in the agenda is adequate for the discussion. And I would remind October 13, 2022, next meeting. Very good. Thank you, sir. Climate Action and Sustainability <laughs> Committee, Ms. Whitman. What is in the agenda written up is sufficient. Thank you very much for Thank that. You, Ms. Parks and Recreation Governance Special Committee did meet uh, and the main topic, or the only topic, was uh, the committee made a decision to seek a facilitator to take us through the rest of the process. For those that were on the general forum when the Parks and Recreation Governance Committee was first formed, it was always discussed that that would be a facilitated process. The committee uh, did a lot of educational and, and groundwork and have brought it to a point where they feel it would be best to have a facilitator uh, involved. Uh, the second part of that is we've postponed the meetings for the rest of the year to allow staff to uh, find and bring up the speed such a facilitator. And just We have designated staff to make that selection uh, for that individual or firm. Slow Center Region Library Board. Ms. Collins, do you have anything for us? Yes, I just wanted to add that the uh, SCLO uh, Library Board at their last meeting reviewed the library budget um, as it would be given to uh, the COG. Uh, so that is, um, we're going to be going back to the library board as well as the COG with any modifications necessary. Very good. Thank you, Ms. Collins. Center Region Parks and Recreation Authority. I'm not seeing anyone for those. There's an extensive uh, dialogue in, in our agenda. 
Under other business, we have several matters of record. Uh, Eric already brought one of those to our attention. Any questions or comments on the matters of record? Seeing or hearing none, we are on to the calendar. <laughs> okay, we have a calendar, we have our ample reference links. Anything else for the good of the cause? Hearing or seeing none, I'll accept the motion to adjourn. We are adjourned.